Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Eric Tanzi, back with another episode of the Widener Sport and Event Management Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Dean Tony Wheeler, is joining us today. He is currently the Dean of the School of Business Administration here at Widener University. Dean Wheeler, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so we'll jump right into it here. Could you talk a little bit about your current role at Widener, kind of some of your daily responsibilities and maybe some of your favorite parts of your job? So I currently lead the school as the, the dean of, of the School of Business Administration. What that entails sometimes can be a little abstract. Um, pretty much I'm responsible for setting a general strategic kind of mission for, for what the school is doing and where we're going. That includes uh, making sure that we have current and cutting and up-to-date curriculum. For example, we are in the process right now of sharpening our minor offerings. I'm also responsible for making sure that faculty have the resources they need to be successful in the classroom, to be successful in their research opportunities, to be successful in their external relationships. So a lot of our faculty engage in service learning projects outside of the school. They will work with companies or clients. We have faculty members that actually work with the Small Business Development Center. So making sure that the faculty have the tools and resources they need to be successful. I am responsible for fundraising to try to supplement the resources that that we have coming into the school. So we can then invest those resources back into the students and back in to the faculty. I would feel really comfortable in saying that everyone that works, at least in the School of Business Administration, I can only speak for us as a school, that if if we're not doing this for the students, then we're probably in the wrong business, right? Okay. And so I would think most of us spend all of our time thinking about how to make sure that our students are successful. So it sounds like no day is the same for you. It's always something different. Every day is different. This morning, I you know I had meetings with some donors. I had uh, a Zoom with with a possible institute that we might collaborate with in Germany. Oh, awesome! Uh, I'm here today talking with you. I have uh, a meeting this afternoon. I'm part of a a data analytics huddle that the provost, who's my boss, uh, does uh, every two weeks where we are looking at how to use data better to make better, more informed decisions. Okay. So that's my day-to-day. Tomorrow, totally different. Windows a little brain. Yeah, totally different. (laughs) So I know you've kind of taught all over the United States. You were in California, Oklahoma. You taught at Westchester University. What would you say kind of separates Widener from these other universities that you've worked at? When I was looking at, at joining Widener, the one thing that people talked about most were the people and about how dedicated and committed and passionate the people at Widener are about Widener. And I have found that to be 100% the truth. And it's what I love so much about this place. I mean, I'm so lucky I work for a school where the faculty adopted a new mission for the school that we take your success personally, not just student success, but faculty success, alumni success, our our corporate partners, the community of Chester, that we take their success personally. And I defy you to find another business school that cares that much about their about their stakeholders. Yeah, I think even from a student's pr- perspective, you know, I can kind of see it with some of my professors. You know, they'll go above and beyond for us, and they really do care about our success. So I definitely agree with that. Um, kind of going back to you teaching at all these other schools, what was that experience like? Kind of getting to experience. You know, I'm sure every school has a different culture. What are some lessons you learned or things you picked up on along the way? Yeah, it's it's really I it, and I've had a time to think about this since we've been we've been in, in, in communication. If you had told me when I was your age that I would have gone around the country, you know, that I would have 
gone to graduate school in Oklahoma, worked in California, then Illinois and Rhode Island, and now here. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, so I've, I've gone clockwise around the country. I never would have believed you at all. Uh, I sometimes do I sometimes do sit back and, and just go, wow, I can't believe. I can't believe I've been so lucky yeah. to, to do these things. The thing I think I've learned over my career, especially when it comes to students, is that by and large, we all do really care and even being at universities where you know you hear about research intense universities where there's more doctoral students teaching classes and those kinds of things you know it's there is an end to that and it really is that that people are passionate about transferring knowledge this morning i was on a meeting and i joked with someone that you know i'm i'm essentially a professional student that's what I do. I yeah. love I love learning so much that I've made a career out of it. And I do think that I've I've learned that over the years and I've seen that and I've experienced it. And so I do tend to be when I when I see on the news or when you hear about people kind of knocking higher ed, um, I do get defensive about it. Not just because I'm in it, but because I've seen in so many different places how much people do care about education and our higher education system is one of the true differentiators in a global economy. Other nations in the world aspire to have the United States higher education system. Sometimes we take that for granted and I think it's dangerous. So you mentioned higher education. What would you say is one of the biggest challenges that's facing higher education currently? Well, there's internal and external threats. When, when you look at the cost of higher ed, by and large, over the last hundred years or so, learners have been largely shielded from the true cost of education. So if we were to go back to uh, the GI Bill, you know, to go back to World War II and the GI Bill, the federal government and state governments, you know, for almost a hundred years now, have been heavily, heavily subsidizing the true cost of education. And what you see historically is that as the United States go into recessions and state and federal governments have to pick and choose what to fund or at what level they continue to fund at, we've stopped investing at the same rates into higher ed. And the net effect of that is our learners are being more and more exposed to the true cost. Okay. And I think that's a danger we're coming out of a global pandemic, we're coming out of a, a massive financial shock. If we are serious about keeping our competitive advantage in a global economy, uh, we need to be investing more into higher ed. It's easier to invest in K through 12 because everyone has kindergartners. You know, yeah. I mean, only, only 33% of the U.S. workforce is college educated. So it's a much, much smaller segment of, of our overall population. So that's an external challenge constantly, even at a private university like Widener. But I think internally, some of the challenges we face uh, really have to do with sort of, of the mindsets that we carry. I don't know who said that the, I don't know, there's a kind of a famous quote, I can't recall who said it, but it's, you know, some, it's something to the effect of, you know, the only true prisons we have are the, are the mental ones that we, that we frame yeah. ourselves, right? And I think what we see in higher ed right now is we see people struggling inside of higher ed to rethink how to deploy their expertise. Uh, I've been lucky. The, the faculty in the School of Business Administration here have been eager and receptive to rethink how to deploy their expertise to reach wider but that's not the same in every college or school on this campus, and it certainly isn't the same outside of here. So I think that that can be a big internal threat is that we ourselves have constructed this mindset that the only learning that can take place is in a three credit class that spans 16 weeks in a semester that's part of a degree program. That's our own mental framing. We've done that. There, there's nothing out there that says we have to do that, but we've done that, and that can anchor us in ways that make us less agile 
Okay. So kind of to shift gears here, you recently co-authored a book titled HR Without People, talked a lot about artificial intelligence, things of that nature. Can you talk about what that process was like? I'd imagine getting a book published is a pretty long, extensive process. Um, What was that like? I was lucky. I've been a co-editor of a of an annual series on human resource management. And over the years, you know, this might be my sixth or seventh year of, of doing that. We've had two different publishers, but the current publisher is, is a publisher in, in London called Emerald Publishing. And I never thought I had anything important to write about. I mean, part of writing a book is you have to have a good story to tell. At the end of the day, that's all we do. We tell stories. It's how do we tell the stories? How do we tell stories in ways that are most impactful, that people understand and that resonate with them so that they can then take that knowledge and, and, and go elsewhere with it and make a difference? What was interesting, though, is my time at a previous institution, I'd spent a lot of time talking to accounting people in particular out in the field, out industry people, partners and in, in accounting firms, and I had known from, from previous stops uh, that, that finance and accounting was investing heavily, heavily, heavily into, into AI and machine learning. So I would always be asking them, like, what are you guys doing with this? Like, why, you know, why is Fidelity, why does Fidelity have an innovation center in Boston? Why do you go visit this and there's robots rolling around? And, why is Fidelity employing robots, right? So I would ask them a lot. And, you know, clearly it's because with so much data, you know, if you're an audit, you know, you don't need 50 auditors when you can hire two auditors and two data scientists and audit the same volume of work. And it got me thinking, well, what does that mean for my field of human resource management? So I reached out to the publisher that I had the existing relationship with and said, well, I kind of have this idea about you know what what's my what's my discipline going to look like 30 40 50 100 years out and they said write us up a proposal and they accepted it uh, and they said you know what deadline do you want and they, i picked the deadline the pandemic kind of messed things up a little bit but it was essentially me and, and my co-author who was the professor i studied under i would write the chapters i'd send them to him edit them and go through them. We'd send them to the publisher. Uh, and uh, it went by pretty quickly. Yeah, how I, long was that whole process? Well, without the, how much, the writing time, I was essentially writing at first a chapter a week. Okay. And I, we had 11 chapters. We had a hard word count of 50,000 words, which, which I know to you, you might sound like 50,000 words. But when you, when you write academically, 50,000 words doesn't seem so okay. overwhelming. So, you know, I was like, all right, 11 chapters, that's 4,500 words a chapter. I was writing a chapter a week. The pandemic hit. And for whatever reason, even though I had nothing but time, I couldn't get in the mindset to write again. So I had written five chapters in five weeks. And then the pandemic hit, and I didn't write a word for six months. (laughs) And then the publisher said, your due date's coming up. And I wrote the remaining six chapters over six weekends because I had already started working at Widener. So Saturdays and Sundays, I would write for five hours a day. How was that? Had to be challenging. You know, it's funny. I look back on it, and even during the time, it didn't seem that difficult. But looking back on it now, are you like, how did I do that? Or just kind of... No, it makes me wonder why I could... like. (laughs) makes me wonder why I can't do that more yeah. often is what it makes yeah. me wonder. Like, wow, I was writing, you know, I was writing 16 page chapters essentially is what that would come out to 16, 17 page chapters. I was doing that in two days and shipping it off to my co-author and, and that was it. Yeah. Is there anything else in the future that you plan on getting published or working on? It's or? funny. I had two ideas for books when I first approached them and, and, and it was funny because um, had I known a pandemic was coming, I would have written the second one first, <laughs> but instead I was like, Oh, this whole thing about AI and machine learning is kind of neat. And you know, I kind of got into it, 
the other book that I was that I was was thinking about writing is how we should respond to crises from a human resource perspective. So that, <laughs> that might have been, been an might have one. been a helpful book to have written in the teeth of a pandemic. I have thought about going back and and writing it, and and the publisher has asked me if I want to write something, but I've been so busy these last twenty months since since I started here at Widener. That I don't know if I want to write. I don't know if I want to give up eleven weekends. Yeah. <laughs> to write sixteen pages a weekend, mm -hmm. but now I know I can, so maybe I should. Okay. <laughs> um, so kind of to shift gears here again, um, when talking about a teaching role versus an administrative role, I know you've kind of been in both. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the main differences between the two, and then is there one you prefer over the other? The, the real difference between going into administration and, and being a professor, and, and I didn't make, I'll be honest, I did not make that decision consciously. It sort of happened to me. And then when I realized that I had actually made a choice, I was like, oh my God, it was like, I was like three years into something. I was at a, the University of Rhode Island and the dean had asked me to help revitalize, redo, reimagine a full-time MBA program. And at the time I was teaching classes, I was doing my research, you know, I was, I'm kind of known as a employee turnover retention researcher. Uh, I've done quite a bit on, on burnout and things like that as well. So I was just doing that. And then I get into this MBA program and I'm leading this MBA program and I'm teaching and I'm doing research and, and something had to give. I was still teaching in the program that I had redesigned. So what gave was my research. What I stopped doing was my research. Okay. So I do miss that because it was creative. It was a creative outlet. It's not creative in the way that, that you might think of creativity or that I might even think normally of creativity. It's not like I, I can't write a song. I can't sing. You guys can hear my voice. Like it's terrible to have to hear it. Uh, you know, I don't play an instrument. I don't paint. I don't draw. I don't do any of those things. But even academic research is creative. And what's happened is that the administrative work I do has become my creative outlet. And you can ask some of your professors how creative I can get when I'm thinking about, about things we can do in the School of Business. I do miss teaching. I do technically teach one class a year, but I do that mostly to help. We have some students that because of of the way the course schedules line up. Sometimes they need uh, an extra class to graduate. So last spring and now this spring, uh, I've been teaching a class on staffing, HR okay. staffing, to uh, last semester, last spring it was three, this, this semester it's two. Um, and so I still do have an interaction with students, but I do miss it. And if you all were to see me teach in a normal circum circumstances, probably think it was funny. I viewed teaching as three hours a week for me to practice my stand-up comedy routine. And so to me, it was, you know, I'd go into class and I would just have fun. Like to me, it was, I, I was constantly trying to think of ways to make the classroom fun because when people are in good moods, they're more receptive to learning and, and the learning sticks. So I was constantly doing things to the environment classroom. I would play music before the start of class. You know, we would watch videos, we'd watch the ep we'd watch episodes of the office, we'd do all kinds of different things uh, just to get students laughing and having fun because then it opened them up to under to, to being receptive to information. And I do miss that and and Professor Larson can tell you unfortunately our school meetings are not as much fun. I don't get to practice my stand-up comedy too much in school <laughs> school meetings, but so I do miss that interaction with students. You know, I, I started a student advisory board. You all probably see me walking around the building. I, I try and make sure I, I interact with students because again, what else is my job but to make sure that that you all are successful? I mean, that, that's what, that's why I do what I do. Yeah, and even from a student's perspective, like you mentioned getting students engaged, whether it's something as simple as playing music before a class, like from our perspective, that, that does make a difference, you know, showing that it's not just going to be, you know, your normal class of just doing slides on the board, 
getting students engaged definitely makes a difference for us and our whole learning experience. Um, earlier, you mentioned that if you were to kind of look back on your career, you're kind of like, wow, I can't believe I traveled all these places and did all these things. What would you say was your biggest motivational factor that kind of kept you pushing every day and just kind of to go all across the country and accomplish all these things? And I know, I think you're going to ask a question later about, you know, advice I have to students. And so I'll, I'll, I'll save this last piece for then. But for me, you know, I, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, you know, the son of a, of a single parent uh, who worked for the federal government. Um, I didn't have, I didn't have a relationship with my father. I didn't know him. I mean, I knew him, but, you know, I mean, I knew who he was, but it wasn't like I knew him. Uh, my mom's parents had died before I was even born. So it was me, my mom, and my sister. And, you know, for me, I was, maybe it's because of how I was raised or the environment I was brought up in or the circumstances of my childhood. I was always fascinated by why people did the things that they did. I was constantly fascinated by like, I'd see, you know, a, a girl would reject me and I'd be like, why did that happen? <laughs> right. I was constantly trying to figure out, you know, why people did the things that they did. And I really think that's what's guided me throughout my career, throughout my life is trying to understand, you know, why humans behave the way they behave. And I just love learning. I just love learning. And, and so I've taken every opportunity I could possibly take to try to learn. And whether it's about human behavior or I view history, I'm a huge history person, but I view history as psychology because I view it as a lens into why people were behaving the way they behave. And you did study psychology at one point, right? I did. Actually, all three of my degrees are, okay. are, are in industrial organizational psychology. Um, I went to a PhD program that was a, a joint business school psychology department program. You know, one of the things, you know, I love reading about World War I because I'm try, I constantly try to understand why would, why would people do these things? You know, what's happening now in Ukraine? Like, why would why would this happen? And so that's driven a lot of what I do, even including, like, my passion for traveling. It's just trying to experience and trying to understand why people do the things they do. Um, and maybe it's just this just weird love of lifelong learning that I've had. Okay. Um, so over the course of your career, you've been given many awards. Is there any that kind of meant the most to you or stuck out, and why would you say so? Good question. I've always been someone who who just tried to control what I could control. Okay. And and to me, things like awards were never really uh, goals. To me, it was always about this the feeling of accomplishment for completing something, for like achieving something that I didn't think I could do. Awards and those kinds of things just kind of happen and they don't really have anything to do with me. They have to do with other people viewing what I've done or reading what I've done, but it's never really, it's never really been something I could control. So I don't really spend a ton of time thinking about that, but I will tell you to this day, what I consider my greatest, well, there's two, one has to do with students and one has to do with research. The work I did at the university of Rhode Island with that MBA program I will forever say was was the the best I could ever do to make a difference with student lives. Um, research wise, I was an undergrad, much like much like you are, and I had an internship at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. I was an undergrad at Maryland at the time, and they told me I had to have a faculty sponsor it and had to grade something. So. <laughs> They tell me one day, like, go upstairs on the fourth floor. That's where these industrial organizational psychology people are. Find one of those people. Like, find one of them. They'll sponsor it. So I'm knocking on doors. And at the time, the University of Maryland had what was considered the top industrial organizational psychology program in the world. So I learned later, of course, that these are all, like, these are all, like, in my field. These are all giants. And at the time, I'm 21 years old, and I'm, like, I just need someone to sign off on the sheet, you know, like I, 
None of it makes sense to me. And this one guy, Ben Schneider, he says, all right, you know, here's the deal. I'll sponsor this, but you've got to write me something every week. Every week I had to write him something that I was learning in my time at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. So Ben was doing this for a year. One day, my senior year, it starts my junior year, one day my senior year, I'm in the behavioral and social psychology, social, social psych building um, at the University of Maryland. Ben comes walking down the hall, and he's kind of like your prototypical, like abstract thinking, nutty professor who loses his keys all the time. And, you know, the, the psych department receptionist, they'd have to like put keys around his neck. And, you know, they probably had to like write his name on his jacket. Like, you know, he, he's that guy. So Ben's walking down the hallway. And of course I find out later, Ben is like a living legend. Like he is like one of the top five people in the world in organizational behavior. And he sees me like 30 yards away in the building and he starts walking to me. He's like shaking his finger at me. And I'm like, oh man, what did I, what did I do now? Brian, Dr. Larson can tell you, I, I do that a lot. Like, what did I do now? You know? And so I'm with some of my friends and they see this guy walking down the hall and he, and they, they scatter. And you had no idea who he was at this point. So you didn't No, know. I just think he's this guy sponsoring, you know, sponsoring my internship and I got to meet with him once a week and, you know, and he's just kind of this nutty professor and um, so he's shaking his finger at me and he walks up and he goes, you, you, you write better than 95% of the doctoral students I've ever had. And I was just like, whoa, even then. I that was, was probably like, pretty I was surreal. Like, Whoa. <laughs> a couple of years later, he emailed me and he said uh, he has a theory. It's called the attraction selection attrition framework. And very few people can ever even say what he said. He said, hey, I'm putting together a conference session on my theory. Because he had a theory on my theory. He says, I'm inviting people to come and talk about extensions to my theory that I think are important. And I want you to present. Wow. And I was like, man, that's it. Like, mic drop, pack up all the boxes. Like, I'm done. I could never, I could never get any higher. That's awesome. And it was conference presentation. It wasn't even like a publication. <laughs> it wasn't even like a book. But it was that someone who I admired. Yeah. You know, he was like, that was such a, it was such a humbling and flattering kind of experience. Yeah, but it was. To this day, I'm like, well, wow, Ben Schneider thinks I'm awesome. Like, that's pretty much it for me. You can hold on to that forever. <laughs> yeah, and you guys are like, who's Ben Schneider? <laughs> so I'm currently a second semester senior, um, planning to graduate in May. What advice would you have for me and my peers as we kind of move into our first business-related field and a lot of people as they're searching for, you know, their first full-time job, it can be kind of intimidating and not really know where to go. Say yes as much as you can. Find reasons to say yes. Take opportunities, even if they lead to failure. Because, like, what's the worst that can happen? Move somewhere. You know, someone gives you a job offer in, in Phoenix. What's the worst that can happen if you go out there and it's not what you liked? What's the worst that can happen if you move home? Oh, well, you moved home. But five years later, you're going to be like, that life experience I had moving 4,000 miles away from my home being on my own and it not being a very good experience, that's going to inform your life more than taking a path of least resistance or something that you think is safe. So I would say yes. When you have opportunities, say yes. Find ways to say yes. And you never know where it leads you. I mean, to me, um, you know, I mentioned that, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a single parent home. My mom was always so worried that I didn't have male role models. You know, like, Tony's not going to know how to be a man when he grows up. And so she would do funny things like um, got me a subscription to Sports Illustrated. Like, to this day, like, she gets me subscriptions to Sports <laughs> Illustrated. I'm 48 years old and she's sending me subscriptions to Sports Illustrated. Someone uh, had written an article in the 60s on the island of Tasmania, about Tasmania. It's a state... Uh, in, in Australia, an island off the coast of Australia. And uh, they were writing about it. And I was maybe eight or nine years old when I was reading this reprint. They had reprinted the article from the 60s. And I said to myself, one day, 
I'm going to go to Australia. I'm going to go to Tasmania. Fast forward, you know, 30 something years. And there's a conference for human resource management that's being run out of uh, the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And they invited me to present a paper. And I said, yes. When I was there, I flew, to, I flew to Tasmania and I got off the plane in Tasmania and I said, this is as far from home as I could ever be and no one would ever believe I made it. But it's only because you say yes. I could have said no. I could have been like, ah, oh, it's a 20 hour flight. And I said all that. But I said yes, and I took a chance, and I went out there, and it changes your life. So say yes, find ways to say yes. Easy to say no, hard to say yes. All right, well, thank you, Dean Wheeler, for that advice, and thank yeah. you for joining us today. I hope you all enjoy the podcast.